Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Barbara Casadei, and tonight I'm here with Professor Peter Horby, who is a professor of emerging infectious, infectious diseases and global health at the University of Oxford. The topic tonight is incredibly relevant, and that is the treatment of patients with COVID-19. Uh, we have run a little survey at the European Society of Cardiology um, and find out that the treatment of these patients across Europe is incredibly bare. So it really is a point of discussion and something that we really need to know what it is that we should be doing. Uh, let's not get tempted to do too much too early and most of all randomize in some way we are in a, in a weird way already randomizing, uh, cluster randomizing across Europe. So Peter, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to uh, be interviewed by the European Society of Cardiology on this topic. Uh, you are the, the expert here. So really the question is, what are really the therapeutic options for these patients? Are there any? And what have we learned from the disease so far? Thank you very much, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for um, that uh, rather gracious introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Um, I think as many of you will know, really, you know, COVID is, is partly a sort of biophasic disease process. Um, patients are getting infected with the virus and, and developing a mild illness with viral replication. And then at about the weak stage, people start to diverge. You know, they either start to get better or they start to deteriorate. And that second phase then is you know, also marked by quite a you know, serious inflammatory process in some of the patients. So it's really got you know, two components. There's the viral replication and the associate, associated inflammation. And we've seen that with other serious viral pneumonias previously. I've seen it with SARS, with MERS coronavirus and with avian influenza viruses. So it's, it's fairly typical of these very aggressive um, viral respiratory pneumonias. You know, and it, there's lots of data out there, but this is just one slide showing the, the differences in the inflammatory markers between patients who are hospitalized, but then you know, either recover or die. And, and many physicians will, will be familiar with this picture of those patients with this hyperinflammatory state. So I think, you know, that means that we have a couple of choices. We have target the virus, you know, or also host directed therapies to target the inflammatory response. Um, in addition to that, there will also be all the adjuvant therapies, you know, so oxygen support and, and um, perhaps anticoagulants for those with a hypercoagulable state. Um, but they're really the, the two, two core targets of our therapies. So the drugs that um, we've been looking at or, or we've, we've sort of reviewed for going into trials fall into a few categories. The, um, the main one is, you know, direct acting antivirals. Um, and there's a number of drugs that people will have heard of, remdesivir, which is an experimental therapeutic, lupinavir, ritonavir, a common HIV drug, hydroxychloroquine, which has got a lot of headlines from because of various people's um, uh, favourable uh, speeches about it. And then, you know, a bit later down the line, convalescent plasma or synthetic antibody products. And then there are indirect antivirals such as interferons, and then on the other side, we have the anti-inflammatory, so low-dose steroids, azithromycin for its immunomodulatory therapies, um, properties, um, interleukin inhibitors, anti-TNF, and a host of other ones. There are literally hundreds of things that have been suggested, mostly based on sort of just mechanistic um, theories and, and the feeling that they ought to work, but, but very little based on any hard data. Um, just a, you know, a little bit of background as to why some of those got to the top of the list, like remdesivir, lapinavir, ritonavir, and interferons. It's really because of their history. So they were looked at in SARS. So lapinavir, ritonavir, certainly, and interferons, and ribavirin and others were looked at in SARS and showed you know, um, some promising signals, but certainly nothing definitive. And then with Middle East respiratory coronavirus, they were looked at again. And you can see from these sort of inhibitory concentration curves that again lupinavir ritonavir seems to have an inhibitory effect so does interferon and then a new drug came along remdesivir as an antiviral that also showed um, activity and so lupinavir ritonavir and interferon are being tested in MERS coronavirus or were prior to the new coronavirus and so they sort of jumped to the top of the queue as did remdesivir 
and um, you know this is the this is the only result so far really of, of, of a, a reasonable scale um, randomized controlled trial of lupinavir ritonavir, which is a trial I was involved in with China, which um, we we opened early in January in Wuhan and managed to randomize you know, about a hundred patients to each arm. Um, we did have a much bigger target sample size, but the, the outbreak sort of got controlled, so we didn't reach the target sample size. But you can see from this, you know, that, that, that there are some signals of a potential benefit of lapinavir, ritonavir, but it's very marginal, you know, slight reduction in time to clinical improvement at the top um, of that table, a slight difference in mortality, etc. but really too small to be conclusive. So overall a negative trial, but some signals that um, I think led us to feel it was worthy of going into a bigger trial, especially because it's a, it's a well-known drug and it's very widely available. So is there then anything promising, uh, and particularly also for prevention? You know, there, there is, uh, particularly for health workers, nurses, doctors in intensive care, and, you know, there is a lot of interest as to whether something could be done, and I know that there are trials of hydroxychloroquine on, uh, on uh, prevention. Um, any signal there that that might work or uh, uh, that might uh, offer some protection? And another thing that I wanted to get you back on is this idea of the prothrombotic syndrome, because there is a lot of talk about that. Uh, and there is a lot of interest. And uh, just this morning, one colleague from Belgium told me that they do Doppler in all of their patients with COVID and they find uh, a thrombi, you know, uh, in, uh, in mm. vein thrombosis uh, in over 70% of these patients. Wow, that's a so lot. It, it is a lot. <laughs> is there something, I mean, all everybody gets low molecular weight heparin anyway, you know, I mean, is there any idea that one should do more or, uh, or any plan to do anything like that or, or maybe you know add to the current adaptive trials or, or factor in something that will address this problem? Yeah it's, it's a challenge because the, the patients are quite sick and so there, there's lots of potential um, areas for interventions. Um, if we look at the most promising approaches I think you know the inflammatory process you know possibly um, combined with, uh, you know, infection in endothelial cells, etc., may, may be you know, part of the thrombotic picture. Um, what you want is to stop getting to that stage, you know. So really, I think early antiviral treatment would always be the, be the, um, the first approach. Um, you know, currently we don't have any um, promising antivirals, to be honest. Um, hydroxychloroquine might work, but I think as some of your speakers have said previously we don't hold out a huge amount of hope um, and so until we see um, newer drugs coming along um, I'm not sure that we'll, we'll we'll come up with an early antiviral treatment but I think we need to have a go with the hydroxychloroquine with the, the azithromycin with its immunomodulatory effects and you know in the community possibly um, the pinavir ritonavir um, remdesivir is intravenous so it's not really appropriate for use in the community so I think we need to wait for some more of the drug screens to come through to tell us if there's any um, potential antivirals that can, could be used in the community. I think some will come along, but I think we're a bit of a way off that, yes. I think the other approach would be combination therapies because you're seeing the inflammatory response plus the, 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 anti, the, the viral replication and you need to target both of them. I don't think just targeting the inflammatory response is going to help on its own very much because it's driven by viral replication. You see high viral replication in the patients that are most sick and there's a direct correlation between, you know, viral replication, how sick the patient is and, and, and how um, severe their inflammatory status is. So probably the best approach in hospitalized patients will be combination therapy with a good antiviral and, and an immunomodulator. And then I think you come up to, to the adjuvant therapies like those you know, targeting um, thrombotic events, etc., and I think they should be looked at. Um, but that's not not really my area of expertise. But it's certainly something that we're hearing a lot about, um, and I'm following it with great interest because it, it does seem to be something that's different from you know, the severe viral infections that I've seen in the past. That's right. That's right. 
Well, at least this is what we think at the moment. Uh, you know, everybody's yeah. clutching straws and trying to see what can be done for these patients. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there are these, you know, primary care and prophylaxis studies going on. Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, you know, they're with so far hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. or azithromycin, um, neither of which I think are, you know, uh, I'm, I'm overly optimistic about. I think they're very, very important they're tested properly. So we can either yeah. keep them in or throw them out, but I'm not overly optimistic that they'll make much of a difference. Yeah, same here. No, that, that's good. But do you see a point uh, in uh, using uh, uh, antiviral and anti-inflammatory at different stages of the disease? So you are the the uh, uh, PI of the recovery trial, you know, which is the, uh, as I said, the largest trial, uh, adaptive trial, uh, really testing treatment for these conditions so far with 5,000 patients being recruited in a very short time. Uh, do you plan, you know, do you, when, when you are randomizing your uh, uh, drugs, uh, are you randomizing them all at the same time uh, in the natural history of the disease? So we've actually um, adapted the trial in, in response to the pictures we're seeing. So right. um, yeah. we, we started off, you know, with the, the currently available repurposed drugs, the ones that we, you know, they're on the pharmacy shelf. We know the safety profile. We know that if they work, they could be you know, rapidly scaled up and, and given to a lot of patients. So we started with those. Um, so this is our, our schematic for the recovery trial. So it's a very broad entry criteria. Um, basically, any adult in the hospital with SARS-CoV, we've recently changed it to suspected as well as um, laboratory confirmed because of we were seeing delays in, in, in the entry. Um, and we are going to change the trial to start pediatric patients so that will be coming and so patients are randomized you know lipinavir, ritonavir, low-dose dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin you know so you know two of those antiviral lipinavir, ritonavir and hydroxychloroquine two of them sort of modest immunomodulators but we we've been talking to a lot of the clinicians that have been randomizing and they're saying you know there are this subset of patients who then you know, get much more sick and have you know, really high CRPs and ferritins and high interleukin-6 levels and really have a cytokine storm um, type picture. So we're introducing a second randomization. So in those patients that go on to that stage, they then will be um, randomized to either you know, standard of care or to an interleukin-6 inhibitor. And so I do think you need to, to get these things in at the right time. And that's... An antibody. Antibody against the interleukin six receptor. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think that's the problem also with steroids in, in, in viral respiratory infections. You know, it, it depends what dose you're given and, and at what time as to whether you're likely to get a, a beneficial or no effect or potentially an adverse effect. So. Yeah, it makes um, sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a, mm, very good. So you you uh, are, how many patients uh, are you going to recruit and how many more? Well, um, it's an adaptive trial, so it's adaptive in many ways. I think it's quite sort of um, novel in many ways. So we've made it so that you can add and drop treatment arms. So we will, um, as we add arms, you can randomize to the drugs that are available in your hospital at that time and the ones that your um, patient is able to take and doesn't have any contraindications to. Um, we're looking at the data very frequently. We're looking at it um, every week, well, the, the data monitoring committee are looking at it every week. If they see an early signal, you know, a clear signal, because mm -hmm. we want to have definitive answers that one of the drugs is either not really having any effect or is having a beneficial effect, then we can move it out of the trial and it can go in the bin or into standard care, and then we can replace it with a different drug. Um, and I think we've committed statistical heresy in that we don't have a sample size uh, estimate. Um, we're just going to you know, enroll as many patients as we can and look at the data frequently. And as soon as we see a clear result, then we, we call the answer. I like that. Yeah. I hope that we will learn from that as well, you know, on how you do trials in a, in a, in a yeah, more flexible and, and, and also I'm very impressed by the fast uh, recruitment and that uh, it, it really is uh, very, very impressive. Yeah, and I think that's really due to, you know, a huge team, you know, here at Oxford who've, who've been fantastic 
um, I've been very, uh, you know, amazed at how they've done this, but also, you know, the backing of, of the whole of the NHS and all the doctors and nurses and also of, of, of the Department of Health who've really got behind this. It's made all the difference. So I'm really hoping that, um, you know, I, I think this is by far the biggest trial in the world currently in COVID, and so we should be able to come up with the answers um, very quickly, hopefully. Yeah, that would be great. We, we really need uh, answers and uh, yeah, particularly if we are going to come out of lockdown and <laughs> then... <laughs> yes, which we all hope for. Yes, it's, uh, yeah, that there is always a risk uh, of a rebound and so it would be good to know that one could do something uh, you know, specific, scientifically evidence-based uh, for these patients. So thank you very much. And I think we've come to the take home message uh, to our audience. Okay, take home messages. Number one, don't believe the hype. You can see a lot of stuff out there, miracle cures based on 20, 60 patients, no controls, um, mechanistic models, um, theory, mostly it's based on hope and hype. So <laughs> we need to do trials. Um, I think this is going to be a challenging disease. You know, I have worked in a, in a variety of sort of severe infections like this, and they're really difficult to treat because they're very acute and severe, and you have a very narrow therapeutic window before you start seeing organ damage, and then it gets difficult to save the patients. So <clears throat> I don't think we can expect any, any miracle cures. Um, I think, you know, we'll need combination therapies um, with adjuvant therapies as well. The, the one thing that I am looking forward to is the monoclonal antibodies. I think they showed amazing efficacy in Ebola, which is, you know, is, is an extremely severe and acute disease. And so that was very unexpected. So if they work in Ebola, um, they might just, you know, be something to, to look out for in, in um, COVID. Um, we need to evaluate drugs in clinical trials. 2009 pandemic, flu pandemic, tens, hundreds of thousands of patients treated off-label with unlicensed drugs, none of them in trials. Ten years later, we still don't know. We can't make that mistake again. We have to, you know, hold back our um, enthusiasm and make sure that, you know, the treatments are given in a controlled fashion so we can really learn whether they work and that will help, you know, our patients uh, now and in the future. And my last point, yeah, better a few reliable answers than too many unreliable ones, which is, I think, what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, we all agree with that. No, that's great. I think that this, uh, your contribution will be very much appreciated. Uh, we've had over 100,000 uh, uh, linked to the, to the website, and the vast majority of them come from Europe, but the US also. Okay, great. So I think that... Uh, this message will be heard loud and clear from our colleagues overseas as well. And thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. Pleasure.